All right, so it's a pleasure to introduce our fourth and final plenary session of the workshop. Uh, our very own Emily Fox from University of Washington's Computer Science uh, and also Statistics departments. Um, and so we're really excited to hear about the great work she's doing. And I'm not going to eat into her time anymore, so Emily, please take it away. So, yeah, thanks for the invitation to speak here. Um, so most of the success stories that we hear about in machine learning these days involve a clear prediction task combined with a really massive training data set. But of course, a lot of the problems that we might wish to solve just simply don't fit that bill. So in this talk, we're going to focus in primarily on learning from time series and discuss some of the open challenges as well as some paths forward to handling more limited data scenarios as well as getting at notions of interpretability. So the first thing that I think is important to emphasize is the fact that time series appear everywhere. And that statement's actually increasingly true based on the development of new recording devices and platforms. So for example, this picture here might represent streams of posts and views of users on these sites or purchase histories of users on these e-commerce platforms. There's also been a lot of uh, interesting advances in terms of wearable devices, one of which I like to score, um, that provide really interesting streams of activity data. And for example, in the field of healthcare, there have been advances like electronic health records and different monitoring devices that allow us to start assessing a patient's health status over time. Um, but for the most part, until recently, machine learning has largely ignored time series. And the question is why? Well, it's hard. Um, typically, the number of parameters associated with the dynamical models we use for these data sets um, tend to grow really rapidly with the number of uh, time series that we're modeling, as well as the complexity of the dynamics that we wish to capture. So that means that we need that much more data to start learning effectively. Likewise, the algorithms associated uh, with these models um, tend to be more computationally intensive per data point. So it means that we need that much more compute power. And finally, a lot of the theoretical results that we like to prove about um, our direct algorithms are really challenging to extend beyond cases of having IID data. Um, so cases where there are these temporal dependencies can create quite a pitch in um, extending those results. So what should we do? Should we just give up on time series, give up on capturing these temporal dependencies and treat the data as IID? Yes. One book for yes. <laughs> yes. Anybody That's else? For a <laughs> well, to see why this is a bad idea, yeah. um, let's think about a situation that I'm faced with every week when I try and choose a restaurant for my family. Uh, because my son always wants either pizza or sushi. And if I'm just going to guess at random which he wants, I'm going to get it right about 50% of the time. But if I leverage the fact that if we just had pizza, he's very likely to want sushi or vice versa, I can get much better predictive accuracy, maybe something like 90%. So well, hopefully I've proven to you that capturing the temporal dependency is actually really important. Okay, um, but really the analysis of time series and more generally sequential data is all the rage right now. And why is that? Well, it's really the confluence of a number of factors, um, including the presence of these massive web scale time series, uh, combined with large compute resources and advances in deep learning um, that have led to a number of success stories. Um, so if we think about RNNs and their many variants, um, these underlie the successes we've seen in reinforcement learning, speech generation, machine translation, speech recognition, NLP, analysis of medical records, and so on. Um, but the success in these cases really rely on three critical components. One is the fact that we have this massive data in the first place. So when we're thinking about time series, we're thinking about having lots of replicated time series. Um, so maybe we have lots of correspondence data, or lots of examples of a robot navigating every part of the maze or lots of transcribed audio. But of course, in lots of applications, we don't have that, especially scientific applications. So for example, imagine you're trying to infer networks in the brain. Well, if we're looking at these neuroimaging modalities, it's very costly to collect this data. So we typically only get a few scans per person. Um, and in addition, there's significant subject-to-subject -subject variability, so we can't just pool all this data together um, in, a, in a straightforward way. Or sometimes we actually have lots of data, but not that much data for the question of interest. So in this case, imagine that we're Amazon and we're trying to forecast the demand 
of every product in our inventory. So we have all these purchase histories for all these products, uh, but what if we get a new product and want to forecast its demand? So this is an example of a question where um, there's limited data for that particular product, um, and how do we think about forecasting its demand? Or what if we're trying to detect a rare disease? In this case, it's really important to focus the modeling in on the tails of the distribution where we have limited data. Okay, well, another really critical um, component of the success stories we've had is having what I call manageable contextual memory. So um, RNNs are touted as having this really powerful ability to capture a rich historical context of the input sequence informing um, and using that to inform these predictions. And that is indeed true, but the cases where um, we've really seen these successes are cases where there's really a lot of structure to that input sequence. Um, so for example, in our massive data set, it's very likely that we've seen that structure or similar structure in a maze before, or we've seen these types of words used in this context before, or we've seen a patient with these types of test results before for common illnesses. Um, but of course, again, this is not generically the case. So what if we're trying to forecast a really complicated weather system? Um, and we might be measuring a whole bunch of different variables. Air temperature, dew point, relative humidity, and so on. And this is an actual data set that's collected. And of course, this is a really complicated, noisy, nonlinear dynamical system. So it just takes an enormous amount of data to start learning the interactions between these variables and having a good predictive model. In contrast, if we can think about leveraging some of our prior belief about what the relationships are between these variables, I think we could do much better. Um, another related challenge is one we face when there are non-stationarities. Um, so there are changes in the relevant context to the predictions we're trying to form. So imagine that a patient just undergoes orthopedic surgery. So all of a sudden, the relevant context that was useful for describing that patient's activity level has changed, right? Or as that patient is recovering from surgery, you're likewise having this gradual change in what the relevant context is. Or on the other hand, if somebody has an illness, is it getting sicker and sicker? Okay, um, the last really critical challenge that I wanna mention is the fact that in the big success stories that we've seen, there's always this very clear prediction task and a, this objective that you can optimize. So for example, there's word error rate for speech recognition, group score for machine translation, or the reward function that you can write down for, uh, for reinforcement learning. But what if we have few and noisy labels available for our tasks? And what if our goal isn't one of prediction in the first place? What if it's, or there's no clear prediction metric that we can write down? So for example, if we're thinking about that study of neural imaging data there, it was one of trying to understand these networks in the brain, it's one of um, trying to extract interpretable information, um, a structured learning task in essence, um, rather than prediction. Okay, so in this talk what we're gonna do is we're gonna think about moving beyond prediction on large data sets and talk about some other really important time series analysis tasks. Um, so some that we're gonna talk about are learning interpretable structures of interactions between our observed time series. Um, we're also gonna talk about how to efficiently share information in limited data scenarios. Um, and then we'll touch upon the ideas of non-stationarities and measurement biases. Okay, well to begin, let's talk about some of the work my group's done on learning structured and sparse neural network models um, that, um, get at notions of interpretability and allow us to better handle more limited data scenarios. And we're gonna discuss this in the context of two different case studies. One is deep generative modeling, and the other is learning um, these greater causal interactions amongst nonlinear dynamical uh, processes. Okay, so to start, let's imagine that we want to infer these functionally connected regions in the brain that co-activate in response to certain stimuli. Um, so typically in these analyses, the cortex is divided into these regions of interest that consist of these cortically localized signals, um, and they're highly correlated, these cortically localized signals. And the number of these signals in each one of these groups varies depending on what group we're looking at. 
So for this type of analysis, where you have these groups of observations and you're trying to understand relationships between these groups, um, you might think of using a group factor analysis method. Um, so these methods tend to be fairly interpretable um, and can be made to handle limited data, but traditional techniques are not very flexible. They have limited representational power. So instead, in order to capture the complex um, nonlinear relationships between these different regions, one might think about using some of the latest, greatest deep shattered modeling techniques. However, although these methods are really flexible, they um, are very hard to interpret, and it's a struggle to train these models unless you have lots of data. Okay, so what can we do? Can we leverage some of the flexibility of deep generative models while maintaining the parsimony of these more traditional group factor analysis methods? Well, what we're going to think about doing here is leveraging what's called inductive bias to help with the sample complexity issue, um, where the idea is just to incorporate known structure of the data into the model. Um, and the notion of structure that we're going to think about here is the fact that our high-dimensional observations can be decomposed into these groups of highly correlated variables. And so we talk about this in the context of this neuroimaging application, uh, but we see this type of structure in lots of our lots of data sets where we have these high dimensional observations. Um, so for example, if we think about finance and we have a whole bunch of um, different indices that we're looking at, each of these has an associated asset class associated with it. Um, or as a running example that I'll use in this talk, just because it's very intuitive, Imagine we're trying to synthesize human body pose measurements. Well, every joint in the body is a collection of joint angle measurements that are highly correlated in human motion. Um, and in this case, it's really simple to see how um, it's going to be very helpful to look at deep generative models to capture the nonlinear manifold that human body poses live on. Okay, well, what we're going to do in order to incorporate this um, group structure is we're going to define these group-specific generators and these degenerative models. And for further parsimony, as well as to help with interpretability, we're going to aim to infer a set of sparse relationships between these group-specific generators. OK, we're going to describe all of this in the context of variational autoencoders, which are a particular class of degenerative models. Um, and VAEs consist of an encoder and a decoder. And so you can think of the decoder as a map from a low-dimensional latent code to your complex high-dimensional observations. Um, so in particular, the VAE assumes that your distribution on the latent codes is just a standard normal. And then um, the decoder defines a set of neural network layers that are used to define a conditional mean and diagonal covariance um, that define the conditional distributions on your complex high-dimensional observations. So generatively, you think about sampling from this low-dimensional latent code, and so one specific latent code in this visualization is just a 2D vector. And then you pass that vector through the decoder, which are these neural network layers, um, and that defines this conditional Gaussian from which it's very straightforward to sample. Right, so that's the generative process that's defined here. Um, but one thing to note is the fact that all the dimensions of the latent code, which are just two in this case, but obviously it could be higher dimensional, get entangled through those neural network layers. So it's really hard to understand how different dimensions of that latent code influence different aspects of this high dimensional observation. Okay, <coughs> well, just to complete the VAE a little bit more, uh, because the marginal likelihood is intractable, what the VAE does is it introduces this variational approximation and optimizes this variational objective where the variational approximation is just a Gaussian distribution with mean and diagonal covariance defined by separate neural network layers. So this stage is called the encoder. So you can think of it as a map from our complex high dimensional observations to a distribution on our low dimensional latent code. So this is thinking about embedding our high dimensional observations in this latent space. So we pass it through the encoder and that defines this distribution on latent codes. And the VAE jointly trains 
the neural network layers in the encoder and decoder, the parameters of those networks. Uh, can I ask how, how do you know what the, the brain and the dimension of that space is? Like here, it's hard to figure, how you figure that out if you just hyper two parameters in that. So this, I guess I should have mentioned this on this slide. From here, you can see that this model is really akin to a nonlinear latent factor model, right? So you have your latent factors where the mapping to your high dimensional space, instead of being this linear model that has like a big lambda matrix, is this nonlinear mapping right, to this conditional distribution. So there, there of course is literature, a lot of literature in the linear latent factor model setting for trying to figure out what that latent dimension is, but it's that alone is a challenging problem. And here people tend to just specify some dimensionality and have some robustness to it. I mean, it's still like, it's an art. Okay. It's not a science. Um, but I will show you, maybe I'll come back to that. I don't know. I'll show you how through the sparsity we're gonna have, it It helps with that issue where you can basically consider a little bit of an over, over complete basis as it like extra latent dimensions that it just proves it out. Um, but it's an important question. Okay, so what we're gonna try to address here is this issue of disentangling the effects from the different dimensions of the latent code to the different dimensions of your high dimensional observation. Um, and to do this, like I alluded to before, what we're gonna do is define these group-specific decoders, so group-specific generators. Um, so we have one maybe for index joint, one for the elbow, one for the knee, and so on. And remember, even though each thing is a joint, it's actually a vector of observations because it's a vector of different angle measurements that, that define that joint. Okay. Um, and all these decoders and the encoder are coupled, however, because they share the same length of space and they're jointly trained with the encoder. Um, and we refer to this model as the output interpretable VAE or OIJ. Just like that. <laughs> um, uh, but to really make this model interpretable, what we do is we add this penalty on the weights that map from um, the dimensions of the latent code to each one of the group-specific neural network layers. Um, so in particular, what that allows us to do is learn that maybe this first dimension is important for controlling a joint motion between the right elbow on the left knee, but might maybe is irrelevant in describing the motion of the neck. Whereas the second dimension, you know, describes the motion of the neck, which happens separately from the elbow and knees. Um, okay, and I won't go through the details on what that penalty looks like, but it's a, a structured, um, sparsely inducing penalty that looks a Bayesian version that looks a lot like a group lasso type of penalty. Um, okay. Well, what we've talked about so far is just structuring the decoder, but you can also structure the encoder as well. Um, this allows for more efficient information flow, as I'll describe on the next slide, but another thing it allows us to do is address two really important challenges with um, training VAEs. One is the fact that VAEs assume that you have complete observations at training time, but what if you have some missing modality, like a sensor drops out? Do you just throw that observation away? Do you impute it? You know, how do you handle it if there are, um, so by structuring the encoder, we're going to more robustly be able to handle missing data and just not include it in our training. Um, but this structure also allows us to handle multimodal data sources. All we need here is a method for combining the latent representations that each of these group-specific encoders produce. Okay. Um, so there are more details in the paper, but what I'll focus on just is this high-level structure here. Um, or if you remember in the standard VAP, as well as the OIB that I've described so far, every dimension of our observation vector informs every dimension of the latent code. Um, but what we want is we want groups of observations, <laughs> each group of observation, to only inform the dimensions of the latent code that are used to generate that group. Right? So there's no point for a group to inform dimensions that aren't used to um, generate that group. That, that's where we get the more efficient 
um, flow of information, and it also provides a framework that is much more modular and interpretable. Okay, um, well, we're going to look at some data analysis, and to begin, let's look at um, synthesizing human body pose measurements, where our training data consists of these 10 very short videos of a person walking. So this is actually really limited data for training something like a VAE. Um, one thing that we can look at here is the learned weights matrix between each of the dimensions of our weight and code, which are the different columns in this matrix, and each group of observations, every joint in the human body, uh, which are the rows here. Um, and this is a sparse matrix, so it's interpretable. Um, and I want to emphasize that in the standard VAE, you can't even start to show something like this matrix, so there's no comparison I can draw from comparing across the interpretability. Um, but one thing you can ask, for example, is for every joint, which dimensions of the latent code control its motion? Or you can put that around and say, for a given latent dimension, which joints does it control? Um, and so, for example, what we're showing here in this table is for each of the 16 different latent dimensions, what are the top three joints it controls? Um, and if you move through this list, there's a lot of interpretable structure, but I'll just walk through a bit of it. Um, so this column that I randomly highlighted here controls the right lower arm, right wrist, and right upper arm, which I'm visualizing here. You just step through this first one, controls aspects of the left lower leg, and this next, the next one, aspects of the head and neck. Um, so it's learning these groups of joints that have correlated observations, correlated behavior and human motion. Okay. Well, you might think that this gain in, in interpretability comes at a loss of flexibility of representation. But what we show in the paper, and I won't go through these details here, is that you actually have better held out um, well, likelihood um, on unseen sequences um, when you're training in these limited data scenarios. It starts to converge to the same performance as you get more and more training data. Um, but what I'll show here is just the quality of our learned generator. So for this, we're going to, again, jointly train the encoder and the decoder, but we're going to throw away the encoder, go back to sampling just from our standard normal zero one distribution, and passing these samples through the decoder. And so this should just test what um, the vanilla generator has learned. And here's one sample from the standard VAE. Here's another, and another, and another. And um, my students like to call these samples from the Ministry of Silly Walks because <laughs> the first guy's leg looks broken. I don't think I've ever hit this pose in, in human motion, at least walking behavior. Um, and here are samples from the white bank. And of course, I'm just showing four here, but there's a much larger sample size you can look at in the paper, and the story is consistent. It's much more representative of what human motion looks like. And the point here is the fact that in these limited data scenarios, um, the fact that this model is encoding the structure of what these groups are and then learning these sparse interactions between these groups um, is basically providing a lot of regularization and focusing the learning on this lower dimensional space um, to, to learn better generators here. Okay, um, but I also want to show you a little bit about our robustness to missing data. And for this, we just synthesized some missing data. Here, we're going to change this up a little bit. We're going to treat every group as an entire limb measurement, and we're going to hold out 10% of the limb measurements in these videos. And then what we're going to do is something called conditional sampling here, where we're going to condition on one group of observations, which we choose to be the core body position. So that's shown with these orange dots. And our goal is to impute all these other limbs. Okay, so we're going to do this condition on those orange dots and compute um, where we believe those other limbs to be. And this is what we get. So for a while, we actually thought there was a bug. We're like, we're just printing out this, the ground truth, right, the input. But it's very similar. Um, but if you think about it, it really is a very low dimensional manifold that human motion lives on, right? And just these small changes in core body position give you a lot of information about where these other, other joints should be. So it's not totally unbelievable that we do this. Okay, but I want to return to this example um, that really motivated this model of trying to infer these functionally connected regions in, in the brain, where we're looking at MEG data. So a person sits in this chair, has this helmet of these spatially distributed sensors, 
that provide recordings of brain activations over time. Um, and remember that our observations are defined in terms of these groups, these regions of interest that have a set of reportedly localized signals. And we want to understand the relationships between these different groups. Um, so we can look at this weights matrix that we looked at before. And here what we see is that the different dimensions of um, the, the LinkedIn code correspond to known networks in the brain. So here, this dimension activates other regions that comprise what's called the dorsal attention network. And this one's a default mode network. And there's some other known networks as well. Of course, there are some that don't correspond to networks that we know about. We use this as a tool to hypothesize um, different networks to explore further in the lab. Um, but the interesting thing for me here is the fact that in this much, much noisier setting, we still are able to extract this interpretable information. Okay, so now we're going to turn to exactly the same idea of placing these structured, sparsely inducing penalties on layers of um, neural networks, um, or on the weights of these neural network layers. Um, but in the context of an explicit dynamical model, where the goal is to infer these greater causality statements. So in particular, we're interested in whether time series i is predictive of series j, or j is predictive of i. Um, and here we're showing things just for two different time series, but we're interested in this for large networks of time series. Um, and exactly what I was going to say here. So, right, no, out of all these sets of interactions, the question is which ones are uh, informative of the, the evolution of this process. Okay, so why are interactions important to study in the first place? Why do we want to do this? Well, in a lot of applications, especially scientific ones, like the ones that we've discussed so far, it's the direct question of interest. So when we're thinking about um, these functional connectivity um, networks, so far, what I've talked about are co-activations between regions. That's just one definition of functional connectivity. Another is thinking about lag interactions between regions, so these directed interactions. Um, so that's another notion of functional connectivity that we're interested in. Or in biology, maybe you're interested in studying gene regulatory networks. And so it's the structure of how these molecular regulators interact with one another that's of particular interest. OK, well, the classical approach to doing Granger causality selection is to assume a linear model. So here I'm showing things just for two different time series and two potential lags defined by the lag matrices A1 and A2, and then there's this additive noise term here. Um, well, we can say that series I does not greater cause series J if the IJ entry is zero across all lags. Okay, well, what's the issue with this linear approach? Um, well, of course, in the settings that we've talked about here, as well as many others, the dynamics are almost assuredly nonlinear. And if we assume this linearity, it can lead to inconsistent estimation of, of edges in this Granger causality network. Okay, so what we're going to do instead is introduce this nonlinear mapping um, for each time series that takes the history of all our time series as input. And there's still this additive noise term here. Um, and then we're going to be able to say that series I does not greater cause series J if its nonlinear mapping, so this is series J, is invariant to the history of series I. Um, so what we're going to do in our specification is we're going to introduce these um, neural networks to define these nonlinear mappings with certain specifications that allow us to place these sparsity-inducing penalties to infer these greater causality statements. Um, so as a simple example of what we can do, we can look at a multi-layer perceptron where we take as the input the history of all of our time series. Here now we're showing for three different time series, blue, green, and red. Um, and then take as the output um, a particular series I. And then just think about rearranging these inputs so that we group together um, all the, the history of a particular series and then um, if we place a group-wise sparsity-inducing penalty, like a group lasso penalty, on <coughs> the weights here, what this allows us to infer is exactly these Granger causality statements. So if all of these weights go to zero, we're saying that the history of series two is irrelevant in forming our prediction of series i. Okay, um, well, we can do this 
in the context not just of MLPs, but also recurrent neural networks. And we can also formulate things not just on the encoding stage, like we've talked about, but also on decoding. But the key thing is just identifying these groups of weights, where if you place penalties on those groups and drive an entire group to zero, you're inferring this structure of interaction between the, the series. Okay, so let's analyze um, what this method does on uh, the Dream 3 Challenge data set, which is used to benchmark greater causality selection methods um, in these nonlinear settings. And so the data set consists of simulated gene regulatory dynamics, so gene expression and regulation dynamics for five different networks, um, two E. coli and three yeast. And these networks that are simulated have 100 time series of 100 dimensional networks, and we just get 46 replicates, each of 21 time series. So that's really, really little data. So compared to the complexity of these dynamics and the dimensionality of these networks, we have very few training data points um, or observation points. So um, as a performance metric, what we're going to look at is area under the ROC curve. So this um, shows our ability to detect true versus false edges in the network. Um, so this is not a, a measure of predictive performance. This is really getting at how well we're doing at a structured learning task. Um, and we're going to compare the performance of our multi-layer perceptron approach to the same kind of idea applied to an LSTM, which is an example of an RNN. Um, and then here's the performance of a 2015 gold standard nonlinear greater causality method. And here's a linear approach. And here's a dynamic facing network. But what we see is that there are definitely gains from using these neural network approaches. So this was really interesting to me. Because if you had asked me some years ago whether I would use neural networks in the study, I'd say, no way, right? We have limited data. We're trying to do structural learning. That's not what neural networks are known for. Um, but we see that they actually can provide a lot of promise in describing um, flexible dynamics, but in cases where you can really um, encourage a lot of sparsity to handle these more limited data scenarios. Okay, so we're now going to build on this same idea of studying interactions in time series, um, but in the context of Bayesian dynamic modeling, um, where we're um, not only going to be understanding what the interactions are between these time series, so they're still going to be interpretable by construction, but these models are also going to produce uncertainty estimates. Um, Okay, and then we're also in a section going to touch upon ideas of non-stationarity and handling measurement biases. Okay, so to start, let's describe a collaboration that my group's had with Silo over the years, uh, where the goal is to estimate uh, um, the value of housing at a really local level. So I have to afford these housing indices. Um, so in particular, we're going to look at these census tracts and try to estimate the value in each census tract and how that value changes over time. The challenge, however, is the fact that the data are spatiotemporally really, really sparse. So to get a sense of this, we can look at this chart, and what we see is that in the city of Seattle, um, more than 40% of census tracts have fewer than three house sales on average per month, and more than 10% have fewer than one. So we can look at this a bit more qualitatively. So here's one census tract where we have lots of observations. Each dot is a different house sale. And our goal is to estimate this red curve, the latent value of that census tract over time, as well as this red band of uncertainty. So it doesn't look terribly challenging here. Um, but here's one census tract that over this 17 year period, we only have four house sales. How do we hope to do anything there? Um, well, the idea that we're going to explore here is to discover these clusters of correlated time series. So, in particular, the goal is to discover groups of census tracts whose latent price dynamics are correlated. And if we can discover this structure, we can pool information, share information between these different regions to improve the robustness of our estimates. Um, so to describe the dynamical model a little bit, we're going to take each census tract and model um, the price dynamics using a state-space model. Um, where at some time points we have just a single house sale, other times multiple, and many time points there are no house sales. Um, and so a little bit more explicitly what this model consists of is a latent uh, linear autoregressive process 
on the latent price dynamics. And buried from this equation, just for simplicity, is the fact that we also model a global trend of what's happening at the metro um, level, so what's happening in, in Seattle as a whole. And we also capture um, seasonality. And then what we assume is that each house sale is just a noisy observation of the latent value in that tract, corrected for by house level um, features. Okay, but remember, we don't have just a single census tract. We have a whole collection of census tracts. Um, and each of these census tracts in the dynamical model has this innovation that are driving the dynamics in that, in that tract. And instead of modeling those as independent between census tracts, which would imply that each census tract um, value is evolving independently, we're going to stack these innovations up into a big factor, a big p-dimensional vector if we have p different census tracts, um, and assume a joint Gaussian. And so then our clustering task just boils down to this um, discovering a block structure on this big covariance matrix sigma. So what we mean here is that if census tracts are um, learned to be in the same block, then they have correlated innovations, and then if, if they're separate, they're independent. So if you pass this innovation structure through the dynamical model, you get out exact, exactly these clusters of correlated price dynamics. Um, so in order to learn this clustering structure, what we do is use a latent factor model combined with basic optimal metrics. I won't go through the details, but it allows us to learn how many clusters there are, as well as what the cluster assignments are. Um, and so we apply this model to analyzing some city of Seattle data. Um, and here, this is Seattle broken down into census tracts, and out of the 144 right now. Are the clusters spatially, spatially, or do they not have to be? No, so this is the thing that's, the reason this is very different than a standard spatial process is the way census tracts are defined, it, it means that these neighboring census tracts are actually fairly different. So you get a lot of spatial heterogeneity, and this is like fairly well studied in the literature, so you, you really don't want a model. I mean, you could have a model that had a lot of complexity. There's some spatial structure for sure that you see, but like, um, there are a lot of, it would blur over a lot of really critical features. For example, some neighboring census tracts are totally, totally different in how they behave. And if you build in a spatial model, that's gonna have some blurring across that. So we found that you do get spatial smoothness where it exists without really that. It, but of course, what you wanna do depends on what data you're looking at. But in this case, you, you don't really wanna do that. Um, okay, so in the 144 census tracts, we learned that there are 16 different clusters, they're colored here, and each panel shows the log price dynamics on average in that cluster over time. Um, and you see intuitive structures. So for example, this red cluster, this is downtown region, has the largest bus in the cycle over this period. Um, but you can also analyze things more quantitatively, um, and what we do here is we're going to try to form held out house predictions. So um, predict the price of held out houses. Again, that's not our goal, but we're going to use that as a proxy for assessing the quality of our housing index. Um, and we're going to compare our performance to that of the industry standard case Shiller index. And what we're showing in this plot is the percent improvement of our predictions over case Shiller. So across the board, these are two different error metrics we're looking at. Um, but we've broken our analyses down into the 5% of census tracts with the most observations, all the way to the 5% with the fewest. And not surprisingly, the largest gains we see are for the census tracts that have the fewest number of observations, because that's where sharing of information is so critical. Okay, well, we decided to push our method even further um, and analyze um, even finer scale regions that are heuristically defined by SILA. Um, and what we found is that even though the data scarcity challenge is much larger in this setting, um, we actually ended up with a 5% improvement in predictive performance just because of how spatially heterogeneous housing is. Um, and in contrast, existing methods performing indices, the performance gets worse and worse as you go below the zip code level because they can't handle the scarcity of data at those levels. So if yeah. you Laurel Hurst, for example, the purple local bubble, you can have uh, houses behaving, cluster two different 
pricing cluster? Or is the one of those one? One. So one we cluster. assume within each unit that's given to us, you're going to have one behavior that you're trying to find other regions, other regions that are okay. similar okay. to that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's discuss another collaboration that um, my group's had with Zillow, where the goal here is to study the dynamics of homelessness. Um, and one of the goals is also to assess how changes in rent level affect the size of the homeless population. Um, and we also want to be able to produce uncertainty estimates because that's really critical to decision makers. Um, so this is another really, really data scarce situation where every year volunteers go out with clipboards and literally try to count the homeless population. And the methods that they use vary from metro to metro and they also vary over time as they come up with what they think to be better methods of counting. Um, and another thing that makes intrusive analysis of metros hard is the fact that, of course, it's easier to count the homeless that are in shelters than those that are out on the streets, but that fraction of shelter population varies significantly between, measure, between different metros. Um, so overall, the take-home measure message is that there's clearly measurement bias. So we can't straightforwardly treat these homeless counts as counts of the actual homeless population. Um, so I'll just describe our model at a part two level, where we introduce this dynamical process to model the non-stationary dynamics of the overall population in a given metro, and then we assume that our census counts are noisy observations of that total population. Um, and then we introduce another dynamical process to model the log odds of homelessness, <laughs> that's regressed on the Zillow rent index. Um, and then we assume that the total homeless population, which very critically we assume is unobserved, is a noisy function of the total population as well as the log odds of homelessness. And then we introduce a count accuracy that's informed by metro level information for each one of these different metros. And then our second source of counts beyond the census data are the homeless counts, and we take those to be um, a function of uh, this unobserved homeless <coughs> population and the count accuracy. So are, are one of the two homeless populations and noisy census homeless counts? This is total metro. This is not yeah, homeless. This is one, overall. Blue ones. This. This one? This yeah, is those, those are total population. Total population. Okay. Everything here is for total population. Mm -hmm. This is how, like, chances of being homeless. This is what an unobserved what the total homeless population is, and this is what we count the homeless population to be. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so in contrast to past methods, we're directly modeling count data, um, and we're also very critically treating the true number of homeless as missing data. Um, and we're able to form these year-over-year -year forecasts and comparisons because we're introducing these dynamical processes. Um, and even though I'm not showing it here, this is a hierarchical Bayesian model that allows us to share information between metros to help deal with the limited sample size. Okay, so one thing that we can um, ask is after adjusting for the dynamics of count accuracy and total population, is the rate of homelessness increasing? Um, so here, we're showing what we inferred for each of these different metros, as well as our uncertainty about that estimate. And we see that we've um, identified some metros like New York, LA, DC, San Francisco, and Seattle as um, in what I call a state of emergency, whereas there's others that are more status quo, and then there are some that appear to be making progress. Of course, we don't know why, maybe homeless and Tampa are moving to New York, um, but overall, this type of information is really useful for um, policy making. Yeah. Are you saying this would be accuracy? So these are two assumptions we have. We don't know like actual count accuracy, and so you can. This is something that you can vary in the analysis. So if you're going to do resource allocation, you want to know how sensitive is your inference to what you're assuming the accuracy is in your count. So to show your robust exactly. percent. Right. In terms of like decisions you might make across these things, like yeah. here for LA, I'll, I'll show you in a little bit why you see that that difference there. Um, I'll show you right now. So another thing that we wanted to do was understand. So the question is that in the previous charts when you try to look at prices from different regions, so is the model able to pick up um, if one area gets saturated, how does another area, which is far, especially, reflect the pricing action? 
right? So this is, first of all, a totally separate model from the housing one. Sure. Right, but it doesn't have this like clustering structure. It's just sharing information between parameters in a sense of like having a prior that is that informs multiple different parameters that then kind of get shrunk together. If that makes sense. Yeah. But it won't have like as explicit of a structure as what you're talking about. Sorry. Um, okay, so right. <laughs> so as we change, um, uh, we look at the percent increase in what's called the Zillow rent index, so think of that as assessment of what rent levels are like in the metro. What do we expect the size of the homeless population to be? Um, so we're showing our posterior mean at 95% credible intervals, and we're looking here, so this is just for New York and just for LA, and we're showing these estimates both for what we expect the total population and the counted population to be. Um, and what we see is both for New York and LA, um, we expect as we increase rent, we're gonna have to see an increase in the size of the homeless population. Um, but interestingly, or not so surprisingly, in LA, um, what our model forecasts is different for the total um, number than the counted. And that, of course, is because LA has a much larger unsheltered population, right? And this is where assumptions in the count accuracy can be pretty influential on what's decided. Um, but what we actually found, if you look across all metros, is you have these really wide uncertainty intervals. Um, and there's typically only a weak relationship between rent and um, the, the effect on the size of the homeless population. Um, and so it's not so surprising, given how noisy the data collection process is, as well as how limited data we have available. Um, in contrast, house methods were really overly confident in the inferences they were drawing because they were treating the counted number of homeless as the actual homeless population. So they are ignoring the noise in the homeless and census count processes. Okay, um, so stepping back, this issue of having measurement bias and non-stationarities, it's endemic to many, many data sets. Um, so, but if we think about this measurement bias issue in particular, um, if we just took these homeless counts and shoved them into an RNN, I have a lot of issues with what inferences might be drawn there, right? Because you have to think very carefully about what the data are and are not telling you about um, the particular question of interest. Okay, um, and if we go back to this idea of efficiently sharing information, what we've talked about so far are these structures that allow you to more efficiently share information um, between data streams. So we talked about these ideas of clusters and hierarchies of time series, or any of these sparse directed interactions, or thinking about low dimensional embeddings. And these are different structures that my group's thought about in different contexts in many cases. Um, I'm just gonna very, very quickly go over this because there are very good questions, but I don't want you guys to go too much into your poster session. So, this was like this little thing I added that is fairly irrelevant to the next part that I want to go through. Um, but there's another type of way we can think about sharing information in our time series, and that's to think of switches between simpler sets of dynamic behaviors, where here we're thinking about sharing information across time, if we see the same behaviors appearing again and again. Um, so I'm actually, in the interest of time, going to skip this part, but the whole point is so, come talk to me afterwards about it. But the point is this, which is that for many complex dynamical processes, you can actually describe the dynamics as switches between a set of simpler dynamic behaviors using things akin to hidden Markov models. Um, and so some examples that my groups looked at are automatically parsing EEG recordings, speaker segment diarization diarization detecting um, changes in regimes of volatility and stock indices, or segmenting a human chromatin sequence. Um, but overall, what I wanted to mention is the fact that these are really useful representational frameworks, and there's a lot of opportunities to combine flexible neural network-based components in these types of modeling frameworks that allow us to go beyond assumptions of Gaussian, uh, Gaussianity and linearity, um, but allow us to handle more limited data scenarios and extract notions of interpretability or more 
um, meaningful information out of the dynamical processes we're, we're studying. Okay, so on the very last part of the talk, what I wanted to touch upon is a really critical challenge of how we think about scaling up inference um, and the types of dynamical models we've talked about. Um, so just to motivate this, let's look at some intracranial EEG recordings. Um, so this is actually just a snippet of recordings in a really long time series. Um, so there's a patient that has seizures, and there are many episodes of interest in this uh, very long recording. Well, I mentioned very, very briefly a couple slides ago that um, we looked at, we had this project where we were trying to automatically parse these recordings into um, outputs that were very interpretable for neurologists to quickly skim and act upon. Um, and the model that underlies that uses a state-space model, just like what we talked about for the housing application or the homelessness study or the motion capture application that you quickly click through. Um, so, you know, state-space models are a very broad class of um, dynamical models and can be used for many purposes like segmentation, smoothing, and filtering, and forecasting. Um, and if we look at the, the log joint probability um, of a state-space model, it decomposes as follows. And when we're thinking about learning the parameters in these models, um, a really critical term to look at is the log marginal likelihood. But note that when we're marginalizing over this latent state sequence, we're breaking this Markov structure and inducing these really long-range dependencies between our observations. So typically, learning algorithms um, iterate between imputing the latent state sequence and updates to the model parameters. OK, so we're going to focus on learning algorithms that compute the gradient of this log marginal likelihood, or that's also called the score function. Um, and using Fish's identity, you can rewrite that um, as this expectation here. Where the key thing to note is that this expectation is conditioned upon the full observation sequence. Okay, so you can actually efficiently compute that expectation using a dynamic programming routine, which there are different words for this in different um, literatures, but we call it a forward backward algorithm. So you're propagating information forwards and then propagating information backwards, and you can combine these messages to form smooth estimates of the state at every time point on the filtering common smoothing and other models and literatures. Um, and then you use these smooth state estimates to do an update, and we're going to think about doing a gradient-based update of our model parameters, and then you iterate, right? Well, the issue with these types of algorithms is that the complexity grows linearly with the length of the time series. So that doesn't sound too bad, but what if you have millions of observations? It starts to be pretty prohibitive to do this iterating again and again over millions of observations. So can we use stochastic gradients instead of um, the standard gradients? Right, so what if I just grab out a little subsequence, do a forward backward just locally on that subsequence, use that, those smooth state estimates, as a noisy gradient update, a stochastic gradient update of my model parameters, iterate on another subsequence, and so on. Yeah. How do you initialize the little piece? Okay, I mean, so how do I wait, initialize the wait. messages in those pieces? Yeah. So imagine initializing from this, uh, your current estimate of the stationary distribution at one end. People do all sorts of things. They do really naive things as the polite way of saying it, right? So you're going to say we don't actually propose doing this, but um, so people do this all the time. And it seems reasonable because Normally, the story in the literature, the Sasha will point out all the caveats are that you know you apply stochastic gradients and things work out just fine, just like you they would have if you had done them for standard gradient updates. Um, but of course, the, the issue with this is what um, Sasha is alluding to here: the fact that you're not propagating the information you should have in that forward backward from outside that little you're breaking critical dependencies in the chain. Um, and what this does is it introduces biases. And those can be pretty, pretty important. Um, so what we're going to propose doing is to um, account for those broken dependencies by leveraging the memory decay of the process. 
um, so that we can still act locally with provably good um, approximations to what we should have been doing. Um, so here, to start the derivation, let's go back to the score function of Fisher's identity. Um, because it's a state-space model, you can rewrite it as follows. But remember, you have this expectation over the full state sequence. Um, well, the naive gradient update that I showed in pictures on the last slide subsamples a subsequence of observations, S, that's like observations in that little box. Um, but critically, it also takes this expectation that forward backward just over that box. So not only is the gradient information just what's in that box, but your forward backward is as well. Um, and so you can see where the bias comes in here. You can go back to an unbiased gradient estimator by going back to the whole forward backward. You can still do your update based on the subsequence here, just looking locally at that window, but you still have to do that full message passing which was the computationally prohibited thing in the first place. So what we're going to propose doing is something between these two extremes. Um, it's a pretty obvious thing to do, but we're going to prove the um, accuracy of these approximations. So in particular, we're going to have our gradient update be based on information within our subsequence S, which is shown in this black box here. Um, and that's what's here in the equation. But when we're doing our expectation, we're going to use what we call a buffered subsequence, S star, this red box here, um, where the high level idea is that we hope that the observations within that box account for enough of the memory of the process so that when we look locally in this box, it's good enough. Are you able to characterize how we will do? Yeah, so one more slide. There you go. And I'll just say this very quickly, and I'm happy to talk more offline about the details, but what the theorem says then is that under a set of assumption, Dr. Mark goes to the paper, or read this more carefully, um, the difference in our expected score function, when we do the forward backward, so again, this, we're looking at the score function just over what's in this subsequence here, um, but we're going to do the forward backward on the full observation sequence compared to the forward backward just on the buffered sequence. And we look at that difference in um, the expected scores and it's upper bounded as follows, where we see that there's geometric decay in the length of the buffer size. Um, and it's constant with respect to the length of the subsequent size, where the intuition there is that the errors really accumulate at the endpoints. Um, but the take home message is that you can actually get away with fairly short buffer lengths in practice and have a pretty good approximation to what you should have been doing with the full sequence. So just a few pictures on this. Um, so this is a simulated dynamical system. It's really in 2D shown here, just showing this 1D margin. Um, and we're going to do a full Bayesian analysis. So this is the exact posterior on the state sequence over time. Um, and then what we're showing here is grabbing out a subsequence and doing the naive thing of forward backward just locally and looking at the posterior and you see where the errors are. But if you do this buffering, again, remember that our gradient update is just going to be based on what happens here when our message passing looks at a longer window. So as you increase that buffer length, very quickly you get a good approximation locally. And in these pictures, you indeed see that the errors tend to accumulate mostly at the end. Okay, um, so last thing I promise is <laughs> applying this idea to analyzing this intracranial EEG data, which was really data collected from a dog that had seizures, so implanted 16 different electrodes, had multiple weeks of recordings, and during that, that period, the dog experienced 90 seizures. Um, crazy, but uh, so we grabbed out four minutes around each of these different seizures, and then, so if you aggregate over the 16 channels and the, the 90 seizures, that leads to 70 million time points that we're analyzing. And then we're gonna do a Bayesian approach where um, we're gonna apply our buffered gradient-based updates within the context of what are called these um, gradient-based MCMC algorithms. Um, and the model we're looking at is an autoregressive hidden Markov model to model the dynamics of each channel that we're observing. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to train on 90% of the, the seizure data and then test um, 
look at our held out log likelihood on the held out 10% and we're stratifying that across seizures. Um, so that's what this plot is, held out log likelihood versus runtime. Um, and what you see is that if you do a standard gift sampler, this is what the performance is, um, you might say, oh, that's taking way too long, I'm just gonna train on a subset of my seizures um, and still evaluate on the same held out seizures. So of course it's faster, but not surprisingly, you don't get as good a performance when you're throwing out data. Uh, but here's the performance of our buffered uh, stochastic gradient based NCMC method, where we converge in roughly an hour, in contrast to gives being roughly a week. Um, so um, we're also showing just what an example segmentation looks like here. Okay. I'll stop there and just wrap up by saying that I think that there are a lot of opportunities um, for using neural network models to model complex dynamical processes to move us beyond our standard linear Gaussian assumption. Um, but I think the problems of interest are much faster than just prediction using massive data sets. Um, and we've explored two different notions in particular here of how we can think about applying structured sparsity inducing penalties on the layers of these networks to help handle very limited data sets and meta notions of interpretability. But that's just, of course, the start of what can be done here. Um, so I'll just wrap up thanking the students and postdocs that were, did all the, the real work on these projects. So thank you. So going back to the model of um, human motion, that's a great discovery model that can be used potentially for diagnostics. However, a lot of um, potential use of that is contradictory um, models. Can you comment on, well, I'll back up and saying there's a lot of both clinical and engineering um, assumption that motor control matters. Can you comment on how potentially momentum would Oh, you're saying like to a simulation standpoint, for example, as a response to an external feature, like an angle footer that appears to be a So let me just make sure I have both parts of your question, or <laughs> the setup. So going back to like the VAE, which was great for just like exploratory descriptive um, studies. And then your question is, if you want to understand whether particular regions are effective in certain like in response to certain stimuli or something like this, right? Um, so that's a very good question. And there there are things in that modeling framework that you can do that, I, like I wouldn't take that approach if that was my goal. The, the goal in that collaboration that we had was to understand differences in networks between um, different populations. So those with, um, we were looking at an auditory attention task and those with auditory processing issues and those that didn't have that. And so we can use that for that type of difference between classes. I would take a fundamentally different following approach if I was trying to do the path that you're doing. I think you could, I have to think about it more. There's probably ways to build it into this with like a more kind of semi-supervised type of approach. But this is like a fully generative model that isn't using any like known labels of what um, what the regions are in the latent space, right? I mean, you could do, some conditioning, like it, the model does allow you to do this conditioning and then you can learn things conditional. Right, but I have to think about it more off the top, so I don't have a great answer to that one. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, the um, network uh, that you're using for uh, mounting a green shuttle out, yeah. um, it was made crude lasso on the weights that was given you in for the first layer. Uh, right. Yeah. So, and, and you show that you did. Get your estimates uh, with a very low data regime. Uh, so typically, neural networks are used to uh, predict, use the activation, but not the normal to create as much. And uh, so, do you think that, uh, do you have hypotheses for why you would uh, come up with estimates in such a low data regime? Maybe was it because you are. So, remember so our estimates, I mean, you're, you're saying a good way. Our estimates are presence or not. Right? Because we're doing structured learning. We don't have to get the weights exactly right, right? It's not that we have the right dynamical model, it's that we have the right structure. And that's a simpler problem. Right? So maybe that's not it. 
So uh, uh, also go back to the uh, Puma motion, uh, the, the first the first application. So you're you're discovering actually only observing the spines. Actually, you can recover the whole motion of the thing. So in fact, like the choice, uh, I was thinking, is there a way to actually automatically discover what part of what, what part of the body actually is the minimum the requirement to actually recover the whole motion? Like, is, is there? Uh, is, is that selected by a student? Uh, by, by yeah, that, well, yes. yeah, that was a student who was like, I wonder if I can dishonest without talking to Yeah, exactly. But, but like, you can only observe this one. The, the, the pen is not, not going to recover all of the. Well, so in that setup, we were looking at an entire pen. So there were five different groups. There were each leg, each arm, and then the core. And I actually think from an arm, I mean, there, there is the identifiability. Of the pen. you're really capturing very well what the correlations are between this, like the dimensions of this high-dimensional vector. Right. Yeah. Yes. Because we're still treating the dimensionality of that vector the same. Like we still have every joint. It's just what you define the groups as yes. is only in that case five instead of the other one. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, in, in the paper we compare to, there are these other methods that have looked at human motion a lot and use different forms of like embedding the nonlinear net, like modeling on the nonlinear net hole. And so we compare to those and show that we actually got better performance in this case. But yeah, um, I do agree. I yeah, I, it's completely a very very compressible setup, right? Like that, like. Yeah. Is the reason it's interpretable because it has just one layer? Yes. Sorry. Is the reason that that, that method is interpretable is because it just has one layer? Right. So that like the Granger Castle one or the, um, the human walking thing? Oh. So it actually it, it doesn't have just one layer. It has many layers. So for both of them, it doesn't matter how many layers you have. It's just. Okay. So the the sparsity is on just one layer. But that one layer knocks out all the influence moving down. Okay. If that makes sense, you could though. There, there is an issue that you could imagine shrinking the influence of that first layer and then increasing the influence of subsequent layers, right? You could make up for it, and then you think it's shrunk, but it isn't really. But that's details I didn't go into the talk where we we force it so that it can't keep out these through this prior specification. So you, you do get identifiability of what the structure is through that first layer, being knocked out or not. Did I answer? I don't know if we can catch on. Maybe one more question. Just one more. Um, so, so when you have the, the different tracks, and there were clusters, but they were, like it wasn't obvious why they'd be connected. And was it, did, did those tracks happen to have statistics that match so you can group them or like were you able to look and say oh each of those has a toxic waste dump and so they oh, you mean the like, same like, like, in our validating whether it's a good clustering or not well not or if good in the sense that was the clustering purely because the statistics happen to match or was it because you could look and say oh there's some underlying latent thing that affects them all right so the i let me answer this in multiple parts i know so there's nothing, like we're not passing any other covariates or things like this into the clustering. So it doesn't take features of the neighborhoods or any of that kind of information into account. Um, so we're not explicitly clustering on that type of information. We're just clustering on the, the price, uh, the house sales prices. And then we're learning these, like what the clustering on the latent dynamics looks like. Um, yeah, but I mean, for sure, if you have one thing that's driving the dynamics in many neighborhoods, like one real estate agent controls 
the whole market in all four of these neighborhoods, right? And yes, that is exactly why those things would be inferred that way, but we don't have a way to validate that. Um, the way we were basically, I mean, we did do some qualitative digging in whether that it made sense what was coming out of the clustering, and there was like beyond the downtown, and a thing I pointed out that's in the paper, and like the grad student at the time found her neighborhood, which matched other low income neighborhoods, and she was like, yes, this is good. Because she was a grad student, right? And living in a low income neighborhood. But there, there's further than that. But um, we're, you know, it, it's hard to validate whether it's a good clustering or not, but the point was really to form more robust estimates of the housing index. Again, it always goes to what's the question. So like going back to the answer before, like that question was just one of structure learning, not having a good predictive model. Here, the question is the opposite, it's having a good estimate of the index. The structure is helpful in making that more robust, but it's not the actual structure that we care about. We just want more. We just want to share, and we validated that through a couple methods, one being held out house predictions, um, but we also compared to these like Zillow-based measures that they have and showed that our method was closer than these other indices. Great, right, well let's thank Emily again for a great <laughs>